uh, call up uh, two people up here, Justice Amon and Dee. Denicia is going to come on up, and they're going to do a um, responsive Dionysia. I didn't say that right. Dionysia, Dionysia. Let's say that together. No, that's okay. <laughs> Dionysia, um, D. We call her D, but Dionysia. And they're going to have a responsive reading for us. And so I encourage you to again, just we're going to slow down. We're going to hear them read, and then and we're going to read another line as they lead us. So thank you both for leading us in this way. All right. We're going to read scripture together, and you guys are going to follow along with justice. To announce the birth of Jesus, a company of the heavenly host appeared to the shepherds, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to all whom God favors. And so, with the angels we say, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all peoples. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. These will be his royal titles. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His ever-expanding, peaceful government will never end. He will rule forever with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David. The passionate commitment of the Lord Almighty will guarantee this. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For your mercy and loving kindness, and for your truth and faithfulness. And so, with the shepherds we rejoice, glorifying and praising God for all the things we have heard and seen. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Okay, we ready to go? Okay, a few of you, you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> so notes are available, and if you don't know this, they're out there on our uh, now moved Welcome Center. And uh, if you want those to follow along, you sure can. They are pretty much similar to what I have in front of me. And if you're online with us, there should be notes somewhere in the box, or you can go over to um, crosspointrockford.com and download those there. All right, well, this morning and the next four weeks, we, of course, are focusing in on a familiar story to most of us. So we, most of us, I uh, imagine, are familiar with the major characters. We have Joseph. We have Mary. We have the angels. We have the star. We have the shepherds, the wise men, and, of course, baby Jesus. And so over these next four weeks, as we look at four different windows into this amazing event, I am asking us to slow down, to read carefully, and to understand some things, hopefully at a deeper and fuller level. So this morning in our first passage, we're turning to Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, so if you have a Bible, go ahead, open it up, Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to start with verse 18. Now, this passage gives us the details of God's interaction with Joseph. Luke, by the way, gives more, um, more of a window into God's interaction with Mary, but in this passage in Matthew, it's God's interaction with Joseph. And from this passage, my hope is that we would understand more things about God and why these things matter to us. 
And when you read scripture, I'm going to encourage you to ask questions of it. Not to just what is happening, who are the major characters, and how it fits into the larger biblical arc of God's story. But ask a question, what do I or what do we learn about God from this passage? So I am using that lens this morning as we look to this familiar portion of Scripture to ask the question, God, what do we learn about you? And again, my hope is that we would understand some concepts about God. And from these things, we'd ask, why does this matter? And then apply what we have learned or what we're going to participate in this day to our lives. Now, Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, starts with a genealogy. This is a list of names. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 goes like this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, who is the son of David and the son of Abraham. This is how the New Testament starts with a genealogy. Now, we know that this book of Matthew, the Gospels, and really all of Scripture is focused upon one person, namely Jesus, who is the Christ. And this story, this wasn't a a figment of imagination or a construct that these early disciples of Jesus just kind of decided to make up. What we are talking about is rooted in history. There is a lineage, a line of individuals that stretches all the way back to the beginning. And Jesus' long-anticipated arrival is, stems from God's working amongst humanity for, over the course of time. This is why these things are important, that Jesus could be traced back and traced back and traced back. And there's two highlights that are, that are um, shined upon this long list of names, namely David, who was King David. And his significance is because God spoke to him a promise. And from his line, from his lineage, there would come the Messiah. And so there's a highlight on this saying, hey, I want you to know, Jewish people, hey, I want you to know, world, that this Jesus is from the line of this David, and from this David, God promised that he would come. And then it continues to go back all the way to another individual, and we're going to study the life of Abraham in the new year through the winter and into the spring. That's going to be our sermonic focus during that period of time focuses on Abraham. Abraham is also significant because this is a man in which God chose among all of the people that are living on the earth at that time, called to him, and Abraham responded in faith, and he's called the father of the faith and the father of the faithful. So this story, this person, Jesus Christ, didn't just arrive on the scene out of nowhere. No, there is intentionality to his life. And there is a connection to all that was written in the Old Testament. All of those things developed God's interaction with his people. And there was this anticipation of the one that was to come. There was inklings of this person, all the way even from Genesis where we see the interaction of the serpent with the first couple, Adam and Eve, and there was a transgression or a sin, and this serpent tempted this first couple to to go their own ways and rebel against God. And God, in his declaring of both a curse and a blessing, said, from you there will be one that this serpent will bite your heel, but he will crush you your head. And so this serpent crusher is seen right from the opening pages, and we see these stories of him, and there's an anticipation that a perfect prophet would come on the scene, that a pure priest, not the priest who had to be 
purified from their own sin, but the priest who was truly, morally, spiritually pure would arrive. That there would be the king of all kings would arrive and the prince of peace and this one that was proclaimed in Isaiah, this wonderful counselor, the everlasting father, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, the redeemer, the restorer, the the righteous one, the Messiah. And all throughout the Old Testament, the question was asked, is this the one? Is this the chosen son? Is this the one that we have anticipated? And so the Old Testament closes with a prophecy talking about one that was going to come before the Messiah, this new Elijah. And then for 400 long years, silence. And then, at just the right time, there was an interaction with the priest. And you know the story, and that's not our focus this morning. But I want you to understand the totality of what was taking place where God sent an angel to talk to one who was serving him to say that you and your wife will bear a child, and it will be miraculous miraculous child and he will prepare the way for the long expected season and so we are going to now go to Matthew chapter excuse me chapter 1 verse 18 as you can go ahead and read through the genealogy and now the focus comes on this couple, and primarily this child. And this is what is recorded for us here. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her. But as he was considering these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him as he was asleep, dreaming. This angel said to him, Joseph, Son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is indeed from the Holy Spirit. This is an incredible story. And we can understand things about God from this story. Now, we can focus on Joseph. We can focus on Mary and their responses. But I want us again to look at God. What does this tell us about God? Well, one thing is that God can speak 
to anyone, anywhere, at any time. So these were two God-fearing and upright people. They lived in a small town, away from the shimmering lights of the city, away from all of these uh, centers of commerce. They were out in the country in some small town that was forgotten perhaps by so many. Now, the passage says that they had not been physically intimate at this point. And this young betrothed lady, this young, sweet, godly girl was found to be with child. Now, during my high school days, I grew up in a small town and news and small towns travel fast. Now, could you imagine how societally scandalous this was? Here was this good Jewish couple that were engaged to be married, and it was discovered, found out that this young, good Jewish girl was pregnant. And I'm not sure how Joseph found out, right? Did he hear that someone said, hey, Joseph, I have something to tell you? Did he observe in looking at her, thinking perhaps she needed to cut out eating so much at dinner? Did Mary have a conversation with Joseph and say, hey, I have something I need to tell you and please sit down? Could you imagine how this conversation would have went? Right? Joseph knew he wasn't the father. Here was this young, his young fiance approaching him with the news that she was pregnant. Now, what if you were Joseph? How would you feel? What would you think? Can you imagine how this announcement rocked his world. And by the way, you notice, (laughs) if you go over and read Luke's account where the angel Gabriel, his name there, came to Mary, Joseph wasn't there. So Mary had the responsibility of telling this news to Joseph. And we can tell by Joseph's response and the angel's communication that Joseph didn't believe Mary. Would you have believed her? Yeah, I know I'm pregnant, but it's from the Holy Spirit. He might have thought that she was crazy. He's a little off a rocker. God talked to you? And then this happened? Right. Joseph was deeply troubled. I'm sure he stayed up at night and thought this through, and who is this girl, and what if I marry her? They would think that then I and her and we slept together, people wouldn't believe us, which would mean then I would have that hanging on my head or I can just let her go. I imagine that he was heartbroken. 
I imagine he was disillusioned. I imagine he was confused. Now I have to ask myself, and we have to ask ourselves, why didn't God tell Joseph sooner? God could have sent the angel Gabriel, where Mary and Joseph were perhaps sitting down, having a meal together, and appeared to them at the same time. Have you ever thought about that? Like, why did God send an angel solely to Mary? And then at least maybe three, four, five, six months later, I don't know how long it was, didn't say anything to Joseph. And why did God say it to him after he had a conversation with Mary? Why? They asked us to ask a bigger question. Why does God communicate when he communicates? Why is God sometimes silent? What's happening there? Because I am assured to tell you that God is not mute. God can communicate to anyone, at any time, anywhere. And what he chooses to communicate is intentional. And when he chooses to communicate is intentional. And I'm sure you're like me that at some times you wanted God to talk to you, to guide you, to answer questions. And so we look at this story, and God could have spared Joseph this inner turmoil, this tension with his fiance, this um, struggle in his heart. God could have spared it to him, spared it of them, right? You think Mary wanted to have that conversation? I doubt it. But God was silent. No, intentionally. Why? And this asks the questions to our own life. Why? And so this now points to our theology about God. God is sovereign, and God communicates because he interacts with his creation. We have to believe that from Scripture. We have to believe that from this passage, this passage, and so many like it. So the question is, will you continue to trust him and his timing? Will you continue to trust that he knows what he's doing? God is not doing a God internship. He's not trying out at a trial basis. He is God. And he knows what he's doing. So why then does God sometimes wait? Now we know from Scripture that God does not tempt us. He tells us this. But we also know from Scripture that at times God tests us. And it's not for him to find out what's in us because he already knows. It's not for his information. He's not sitting there like, I wonder how she's going to respond right now. He knows. Why does he do this? So that number one, we can see clearly who we are. A lot of us are self-delusional about how we are. You know that? We like to think of ourselves a lot better sometimes than we actually are. I'm included in that. Tests show (laughs) what's in a thing. And again, not for God's information, but also No, not for God's information, but for our information and also other people's information. More than likely, Mary and Joseph did not necessarily know each other that well. 
More than likely, Joseph was much older than Mary because that's how it was done in that culture. More than likely, it was an arranged marriage. And more than likely, they're just trying to get to know each other. So God, I believe in this instance, waited to tell Joseph so that Mary can understand who this man was. Why you have a description. Joseph was a just Man, why was he just? Because Mo, excuse me, Joseph could have taken this young lady, brought her up to the city council, and said, she's been unfaithful to me, according to the law, stone her. You know, he could have done that. But because he was a just man, and he was right before God, and he knew that this was problematic, He wanted to do what was right, and he struggled. And he says, I love her. I'm going to separate, but we're keeping it quiet. Mary understood his struggle. Mary saw his character. That's perhaps a reason why God did not speak to Joseph initially. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes in my life, in my walk, when I have prayed and talked to God, sometimes there's clarity. By the way, if you hear anything from God, you always have to make sure it can be verified by the word or the spirit of the word. Does that make sense? Okay. But people tell me horrific things that they said God told them and God had nothing to do with it. But often there is a direction that would be given and is somewhat, at times, like a GPS. You guys all have GPSs on your phone, tells you where to go? When I drive down to Tennessee to see our kids, there's some long stretch of highways. And so it'll tell me, for the next 164 miles, stay on this road. And then dial it. Sometimes in our life it's like that, where God will give you a direction, and they'll be quiet. Now you can check, and you can say, well, I'm still going, and then just stay going and trust that you're doing what he has you to do. But there are times when we have to make a decision. We have to take a right turn, or we have to veer to the left. At those times, often there's a little nudge. Hey, in 1.2 miles, turn right. And I've had times when it's that clear. Now, at other times, when I'm heading the wrong direction, just like your GPS, it says, turn around, turn around, turn around. It gets louder and louder and louder. You're going the wrong way. And sometimes the Holy Spirit does that when we know we are not moving in a Godward direction. It's called conviction. And sometimes if we miss the turn in God's grace, he says, rerouting. Sometimes we don't hear the voice of God, just like our GPS, because the music of our life is too loud and we have to turn it down and seek to listen. God has reasons why he speaks, when he speaks, what he speaks. The question is, will you continue to trust him based upon what you know already. This will help you. This will help you. So God in his sovereignty, after Joseph's character was seen, then communicated to him in a dream. Why a dream? Perhaps that's the way that Joseph best could hear. He didn't appear to to marry in a dream. Came to her in person this angel 
Joseph was in a dream. Why? This is how God chose. It could be because the old men will dream dreams. The young people will see visions or even be interacted with in this way. But know that God can communicate to anyone, anywhere, at any time. Why it matters? Because no one is outside of God's reach. Are you hearing me? Some of you perhaps have given up on your mom. Or you're longing for your niece to come back to Christ. Or you're wondering about your children. Or you're thinking of your jailed loved one. From this passage, we can understand about God that can communicate to anyone, anywhere, at any time, which means no one is outside of his reach, which gives us hope. God will guide you when you need it most. You hear that. He's not abandoned you. He will be found by you. Scripture tells us this. You seek him with all your heart. And if you feel like God has not communicated to you, my advice and scriptures advice to you is keep moving in the direction you know you need to go. Keep moving. Just like a vehicle, you can steer a moving vehicle. Keep moving forward. Go check the last direction and see if you are following it or if you have abandoned it. And if you have, then return to do what you did at first. So this is the first observation from this interaction. God can speak to anyone, anywhere, at any time. And then God communicates the reason for this one called Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Verse 21. As Joseph is dreaming, this messenger is communicating to him, hey, this is true, don't be afraid, take her to be your wife. She's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. He will indeed bear a son. And you, Joseph, will call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. What are we to understand about this? Well, understand that God saves his people from their sins. This is the primary reason why Jesus came in the flesh. He didn't come just to hang out with us because he thought we were so fun to be with, even though he hung out with us. He didn't come just to teach us, even though he did teach us. He didn't come just to perform miracles, even though he performed miracles. He didn't come for the experience of what it would be like to be a human, even though he had that experience. The primary reason that Jesus came to the earth was to save his people from their sins. That's the primary reason. And don't get lost in all of these other reasons. This is why he came to the earth to save his people from their sins. What does that tell us? Number one, if you're going to be saved from sin, you have to be one of his people. That means we are born again into his family, which also means that not everyone is is, which cuts out universalism that says everybody everywhere will be saved regardless of 
their belief in Christ or not, which is total garbage according to Scripture. Very popular, though, right? You can believe in whatever you want, do whatever you want. Huh. You say that, then Jesus died for nothing. It's a different sermon. Understand Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Notice that this doesn't say that Jesus came to save you from the sins of others. Are you hearing me? Our primary need is not to be delivered from this world, our primary need is to be delivered from our own sin. <laughs> so God promises to forgive us our, our sin, which means that we're sinners, and his grace, and the title of this whole passage, this whole message is his grace among us, to us. But that does not mean that God will save you from the impact of the sins of others. Has anyone here ever been hurt by anyone? Anyone here ever been sinned against? Do we live in a fallen world where car accidents happen and children are born? With broken bodies. Where horrendous things happen world is full of them, and we as people have experienced these things firsthand. And do not get mad at God by holding to him to a promise that he never made. He said he would make all things new, but he promises you that he primary function is to save you from your sins. Glory to God. It's good for us to understand Christ's primary purpose was to save his people from their sins. Why does this matter? It gives us hope that those who believe in him will never perish but have everlasting life. Why does this give us hope? Because the one who gave us this promise, is worthy of our trust. Hope. It matters because it gives us peace, knowing that we're right with God because of what Jesus has done. It's the gospel. Salvation based upon this son, this long-anticipated Messiah who will save his people from our sins so we can have peace with God. Removes the shame, removes the guilt. Makes us right with God. It gives us also perspective, knowing that he came to do and he accomplished what he came to do. Perspective on trusting God that will make everything new. Perspective that he will be with us to help us persevere. Give us perspective when difficulties happen. He promises to save you from the sins. He promises to be with you. And he asks us to trust in him. This gives us perspective. So from the Christmas story, just from this passage, Number one, understand that God to speak to anyone, anywhere, at any time. Number two, understand that God's primary objective is to save his people from their sins. Number three, as this messenger communicated to Joseph and communicates to us, verse 22. Now all of this, and this is Matthew, giving us the genealogy, 
telling us about this interaction with Joseph. And then he says, now, I want you to know that all of this, it took place. Why? To fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. In this case, it is Isaiah. Behold, pay attention. Imagine this. Look at this. A virgin, which is physically impossible, shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Understand, thirdly, that God fulfills his promises. God fulfills his promises. God never promises something that he will not fulfill. 27% of the scriptures that we have, 27% of the Bible is prophetic. Proclaiming what is to come in that nature. 27%. That's a lot. This Bible of ours contains around 1,817 prophecies. The individuals, the communities, the nations, to the world. 350 of that 1,817 are focused on Christ. All of those 350, about his birth, are fulfilled. Almost all of these prophecies have been fulfilled. You know what the odds of that are? You cannot calculate it. I just ask, predict the score of the game this afternoon, most of us would get it wrong. And if I said, you know what, predict the score of every football game this afternoon that's going to be played, Everyone will get it wrong. And that's just a day in the life of working with some numbers. This is impossible by man, but it's possible by God. So be confident that the Bible gives us 1,817 prophecies. And they have been fulfilled, 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 fulfilled. The ones in which we are yet waiting, they will be fulfilled as well. Right? Come on. Right? So when Jesus says he's going to return, he wasn't lying. When Jesus says that it's going to be a separation and there'll be a time of giving account, he's not lying. When he says he's going to make all heaven and earth new, he's telling the truth. And when he tells us what to do, it's not an experiment. He knows. Will you trust him? So this interaction with Joseph and Matthew's commentary saying, hey, I want you to know that what's taking place here was talked about a long time before. And it seemed weird then, but this is the fulfillment of that. It is connected. God fulfills his promises. It matters because if he's been faithful in the past, he'll be faithful in the future. You can trust him. Nothing and no one can keep God from fulfilling his word. Do you understand that? No power, no principality, no demonic supernatural force. Nothing will stop his will from being fulfilled. Period. Gives us confidence, gives us hope, gives us surety. Gives us strength. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they should call his name Emmanuel. And for us people who don't understand what Emmanuel means in the Scripture, it tells us, second part of verse 23, which means God 
with us. Lastly, understand God's with you. With you. This is not God beyond us. God is beyond us. Not just God above us. This is God is above us. But God is also with us. With you. In the good. In the bad. In the confidence time and when we're afraid. When we're joyous and strong. And when we are despondent and so weak. We have companion, we have a friend. And even though you feel alone, the truth is you are never alone. Someone needs to hear that today. You're not alone. You're not alone. God is with us. Don't ever believe the lie that God has abandoned you. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. You are never alone, which means you're never without companionship. You're never without hope. You're never without help. You're never without his goodness. Trust him. These stories matter. Because we learn about God. Understand God is with us. How does it help us? It helps us with our fears. It helps us with our loneliness. It helps us with our distresses. Helps us to be strong. It helps us not to be afraid. It gives us confidence. It gives us comfort. I want you to know that this day. Believe God wants you, if I can be so bold, to know that this day. So here it is. I'm going to review, and we're going to pray, and we're going to receive communion. So from this passage about the incarnation, that is, Jesus coming in the flesh, I want you to understand. Because God spoke to Joseph in a way that Joseph could understand in God's timing because of his wisdom. Understand that God can speak to anyone, anywhere, at any time. He has not forgotten about you. Trust him. Because of this passage, we can understand And remember that God came to save his people from their sins. That's what he came to do. Trust him. That he will fulfill his purpose. From this passage of God's interaction... Joseph, remember that God keeps his promises. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. From this passage, I want you to understand and remember that God is with you. Be encouraged. Receive strength by rehearsing the old story. And we're going to look at another one next week. Persevere. Continue going forward. Rejoice. Emmanuel is with us. So I'm going to pray quickly for us. We're going to receive communion. Daniel, if you could come up here to lead us in communion. After communion, over on this side, there's going to be a couple here that's there to pray with you. Come on up, Dan. 
pray together, sing together, rejoice together. At the end of communion, we're going to sing a song together as well. So God, thank you for a time of renewing our faith. God, thank you for your word to us today. God, thank you that we can gather in this beautiful building. Thank you that we can sing familiar songs. Thank you that we can yet again together declare our faith in you. Remind us of your promise. Help us to understand about you. Thank you, God. We trust you and renew our faith in you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, wow. Thank you, Lord, for sharing your message through Dave for us. So glasses, you guys are all beautiful, much more beautiful when I do this. And I thank you, uh, thank God that we have physicians that can correct that lens. I have a difficulty seeing clearly without these being on. Some of you know what, I, what I'm talking about. Sometimes I can see without them, but not this small print. And as I said, sometimes you look great right up here in the front, but as I look farther back, it's much less clear. Over the past several weeks, there's been a message going on around me, I felt, reminding me of 